Welcome everyone to our daily broadcast on Kabbalah for Heretics. We're doing as we do every morning and have been doing every morning for the past 25 years. <laughs> every morning, same time, 25 years, same station, going through the Zohar, volume by volume, cover to cover, page by page, sentence by sentence, and in doing that, over these past 20 plus years, we have completed in this thorough, deep way, volumes one, two, and three, and are now getting very close to finishing volume four. When we do, we will proceed to volume five. And when we put volume five out there, which will take another four or five years, then we'll go back and pull it all together. In any event, that's off in the future. Right now we're in volume four, page 25A to 25B. The reason I give you the pages, and the reason I give you the pages is so that you can go and check for yourself what I'm saying. I mean, some of it is so outrageous and to people and so outlandish to people that they don't believe it's actually in the Zohar. But it is. And so I give you the, uh, the page numbers. And it doesn't matter which version you have, which translation you have of the Zohar. The page numbers are always the same. So we left off yesterday with a discussion of the levels of soul and of the levels of soul development. All of us, and animals also, begin at the same soul level, nefesh. Now think of what that means. I really do need to repeat it. It means, and the Zohar tells us, that animals at birth have the same soul as a human at birth. They do. They both have a soul, nefesh. In fact, it's called in some places the animal soul, but it is a soul. This is why in the Great Commission, Jesus says, go now to all the creatures. Remember? Don't make me look it up and tell you. It's there. Go now to all the creatures, not just men and women, but creatures. This is why St. Francis of Assisi uh, preached to the animals. One of the outstanding features of his sainthood. Literally, he would preach to the creatures. And according to tradition, they would gather around him to listen. The Baal Shem Tov, we're told, spoke the language of birds. And in fact, in Kabbalah, the capacity to speak the language of birds is a very high achievement and development in any case. So it goes on. It's, it's, it's talking about the raising of the soul. He says, it says, as for the higher grade, of those who are suspended in the air. Now, we've read this before, but listen. As to the higher grade of those who are suspended in the air, medieval and post-medieval paintings of Christian saints literally floating in the air are not that far off. The pre-Christian Zohar is telling us right here, if you just shut the hell up and look at it, that there are these people who achieve a level of holiness that makes them float in the air. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? And this is as far as man can attain in holiness until he is endowed with a super soul, Neshuma. Remember, the grades of soul are nefesh, ruach, neshuma, and yechida. 
when he acquires that super soul of Nishuma, it ascends among the righteous who are bound up in the bundle of the living. We pointed out yesterday, that's the brain. It's talking about the brain. How do we know that? Because other works of oral Torah pinpoint that. The Sefer Bahir says that the entire body exists for the sake of the brain and that the Holy Spirit flutters above it like a mother bird above her nest. When one acquires that super soul, it ascends among the righteous who are bound up in the bundle of the living in the brain. Now look, this is another way of describing exactly what Tantra describes in Hinduism. Remember? In fact, the, the paradigm is virtually identical. In Tantric Hinduism, it all starts with the crown chakra in Kabbalah, Keter, crown. Male and female are one. That's exactly the same in Kabbalah. The female splits off from the male. That's exactly what happens in Kabbalah, the fallen Shekhinah. And she descends, creating each chakra as she goes down. That's exactly what the Holy Spirit does, the Shekhinah. The same thing. And when she comes to the final chakra, the lower chakra, she curls up at the base of it and goes to sleep. That's, in other words, exactly what the Shekhinah does. And the goal in, in Tantra is to awaken that sleeping fallen bride and raise her back up to meet first her groom and then finally the crown chakra. That's exactly the same in, in Kabbalah. I, I would be able to better describe it if I had um, a chalkboard in front of me and you could see it, but try to imagine it. It's, it's the same. When you have two entirely different cultures, separated by just thousands of miles and separated by thousands of years, both describing the same kind of process, Jung points out you can pretty much determine that that, that process is true, at least for the two of them. But the one validates the other. Now, the... <laughs> the, the uh, ancient alien people want to tell us, and it's a good point, that the reason you can find that, the reason that this process is so identical between the Hindu and, and the Jew and the Kabbalist is because a third party, an ancient alien from another planet, a superior alien, came down and taught it to the same two cultures, <clears throat> first to one, probably first to the Judaic culture, and then traveled over and taught it to the Hindu culture. That, that, that seems a reasonable explanation. I think that our explanation, though, is more in tune with Occam's razor. You all know about Occam's razor. It's a principle in logic that states the simplest explanation that requires the fewest assumptions is the truest. <clears throat> now, yes, you have to make assumptions about what we're teaching is the Zohar paradigm, but they're far fewer and far more extreme than the assumptions you have to make about the ancient alien causation. <clears throat> This is as far as a man can attain in holiness until it is endowed with a super soul, the neshuma. When he acquires that neshuma, it ascends among the righteous who are bound up in the bundle of the living. It ascends this, the spinal column, as it were, both in Hinduism and in Kabbalah. It ascends until it reaches 
the place from which it has fallen, the crown chakra, the brain, the bundle of the living. And there it sees the delight of the king and regales itself with the supernal splendor. It has the aha experience of enlightenment. Those who have experienced the uh, merging of the fallen Shekhinah of, of, of the feminine principle back with the male principle in the crown chakra almost don't survive it. It's, it is, in, in a certain way, actually mind-blowing. And we saw after the, uh, after the heyday of the beat generation, so many casualties of that. It, it was pretty much, along with Zen, the predominant spiritual practice back then, especially among those who were taking acid. Because acid really uh, facilitated that process of reuniting the crown chakra and bang, well, that bang shattered the mind in many cases. I had a friend that did. I had a friend that did. That's not, that's not the same as the other path of enlightenment, where much the same thing is done, but with a different emphasis here and a different emphasis there, so that the, uh, the upshoot is samadhi, not a blown mind. When this is done, the spirit issues forth and cuts its way through rocks and mountains until, that is, it rises up the center column. The Sishumna in Hinduism and the center column in Kabbalah, it rises up. That's what this is talking about. Issues forth and cuts its way through rocks and mountains until it ascends among the holy angels. And there it learns many things before returning to its place. That's the problem that I was alluding to. Many back in the 60s and 70s were not able to return to the place that they started from. The mind was so blown by the experience that they did not return. That isn't to say they died. Some did. That isn't to say they died physically, but mentally they were shattered. And when the holy Shekhinah awakens with the north wind, the soul comes down and that righteous one who has acquired it arises and strengthens himself like a lion in the study of Torah till morning. And then he goes with that holy Shekhinah to appear before the king to receive a threat of grace. The union of male and female, that's the uttermost point of all this. Even in the Hindu part, the rising up to get blasted in the crown chakra is so that you then go back down and reunite with the female, male and female, unite together psychically. Said Rabbi Shimon, are those who possess a super soul, who study the Torah, who worship the Holy King. Woe to the sinners who do not cleave to their master and have no portion in the Torah. For he who has no portion in the Torah has no portion either in the spirit or the super soul but he cleaves to the side of the evil species, having no portion in the holy king or in holiness. 
Again, I have to point out, for all of you in the listening audience, when the Zohar talks about Torah, it is not talking about those scrolls which tell you what you can and cannot, must and must not do. It's talking about Torah as the Zohar, the hidden meanings of the Torah, the oral Torah, the mystical Torah, just as we are doing now. In fact, just as we are doing now as prescribed in the Zohar. It is not morning where I am. It is still dark. It's still night. The sun has not risen. And this is the auspicious time to study the Zohar, the Oral Torah. This is the reason, incidentally, that um, we always have our recording session at, uh, well, what amounts to 5 a.m., in the morning where I am, when the sun is not up and it's still nighttime, because it's still nighttime. We could have the recording session at any time, a more convenient time for all of us. But no, the Zohar is to be shared and studied and learned as we're doing every morning before the sun rises, before morning, in the night. So it says, said Rabbi Shimon, are those who possess a super soul, who study the Torah, as we're doing now, who worship the Holy King, the Holy King, Atika Kadisha, that's the euphemism for the first Sephira. Keter is also called Holy King, Malka Kadisha, pardon me or Tika Kadisha, but anyway, that's what we're to worship. God before it has fallen apart. God in a unified state that becomes reunified in Keter, the sixth of Pharaoh, who worship the Holy King. Woe to the sinners who do not cleave to their master and have no portion in the Torah. Woe, listen to this carefully, woe to the sinners who do not cleave to their masters and have no portion in the Torah. What makes them sinners? This is not speaking of sinners in a moralistic, judgmental way. The sinner here is described as one who separates himself or herself from their master and therefore also from the Torah. The sin is that, separating oneself from the Torah, not cleaving to the Torah. The sin is not boinking your neighbor's wife, although that is a sin. But the sin being referred to here is the sin of not following a master who can take you through the Zohar to the places it is describing. I might point out to you that's why repentance in Hebrew, in the, in the Hebrew language, the word for repentance is tshuva, which means turning. Let me explain why. What is being said here in the Zohar is that the sinner is one who turns from God and the master. Therefore, the way to repent is to return toward the master and the Torah. Thus the language used in the discussions of salvation. Woe to the sinners who sin by not cleaving to their master and having no portion in the Torah. For he who has no portion in the Torah has no portion either in the spirit or the super soul. But he cleaves instead to the left-hand side of God, to the evil species, having no portion in the king or in holiness. Wow. And why is that? Because by not 
studying, in quotes, the Torah as being described in the Zohar, one is not reunifying God because the ultimate purpose of the study of the oral Torah, of the esoteric Torah, of the Torah de Oxalus, is to reunify God. That, that's the ultimate purpose of it. If you've been listening at all for the last 40 years that I've been teaching, you know that's exactly what the Zohar says. <clears throat> Paul says exactly the same thing about Jesus in his letter to the Ephesians, that he unites Jew and Gentile in his own person and creates out of them a single new man. That is to say, he, he reunites the two divided sides of God. The side of Jacob, represented by Jacob, and the side represented by Esau. But the ultimate goal of Kabbalah, the ultimate goal of this study right now, the ultimate goal of what I'm saying and what you're listening to is to reunite that God. It may not appear that what we're doing and saying is directly related to reunifying God, but it is related theurgically by sympathetic magic. In a sense, what it's doing is it is uniting the irrational with the rational the subjective with the objective, the literal part of God with the virtual part of God, just by listening to the Zohar. Now, in case you're wondering who the hell gives me the authority to say that, let me tell you something Rabbi Nachman of Breslov said. Rabbi Nachman of Breslov said that the Zohar is so holy and so powerful that you can achieve results from it simply by casting your eye upon the lines of words without even understanding them. Read it another way. Simply by sitting there listening to me saying the words to you. There's a process going on here with all of you right now who are listening. On one level, you're hearing what I'm saying. On the level below that, the energy of the words that are issuing forth from what I am saying are working their magic on you, inside you, without your being aware of it. That's what Nachman says the Zohar does. Try and see that. Isn't that marvelous? <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? Shut the hell up and listen. Right now, something is going on in you that you're not aware of, but is taking place nonetheless. And what that is, is that the holy energy of the holy words that are from the Zohar that are being spoken by this mouth are reaching into you and changing and transforming you in there. By the power of their words, by the power of the energy it contains. That's what study of Torah means. It doesn't mean memorizing it. It doesn't mean taking it literally. It means, in a sense, right now, sitting wherever you are, listening, however you are, allowing these words to enter in and do their magic in you. That magic being the reunification of God. Then you fulfill your purpose in life. Then you fulfill your destiny. Each one of you, I'm talking to each of you individually now. The process, the means whereby God is reunited are those which we are doing exactly right now, right here, with you and me. Hey, I didn't see that. No, of course you didn't see it. That's why I'm pointing it out to you. <laughs> so you can look on what we are doing here and what is transpiring in a very different way.
What we're doing here has nothing to do with information and education. It has to do with inspiration and transformation. Well, I never heard that before. Of course not. Of course you haven't heard it before. And that always amuses me because the people who say that, many of them say, I'm out of here. Who needs to hear that shit? Why have you come here? Oh, to learn things I don't know. Well, here's something you don't know. I don't believe that. <laughs> Look at yourselves. <clears throat> Woe to him when he shall leave this world, for he is a marked man to those evil species of the left-hand side, pitiless dogs, emissaries of the fires of Gehenna. See now the difference between Israel and the Gentiles. Even though an Israelite possesses only an ordinary soul, yet a higher grade stands over him. And if he tries to acquire a spirit or super soul, he can do so. But the heathen, the Gentile, can never do so on his own unless brought to it by a Jew. He can. That's exactly what Paul says Jesus came to do. Good. Are you putting this all together? I hope to God this is nothing you've ever heard before. <clears throat> because if you think it is something you've heard before, you're absolutely not reading what I'm saying. You're trying to fit it into what you already know, rather than listening to what it is you do not yet know. See now the difference between Israel and the Gentiles. Even though an Israelite possesses, like the Gentile, only an ordinary soul, yet a higher grade stands over him. And if he tries to acquire a spirit or super soul, he can do so. But the Gentile can never do so unless he becomes circumcised. And when he acquires a soul from another place. Notice what Paul says. Paul says, you Gen in Ephesians, you Gentiles, because you are not Jews, are without hope, or without God. But through this Jew, Jesus, and his blood, the blood of the circumcision, <coughs> you and we are united. Jew and Gentile are made a single new person <coughs> in his own being. <coughs> Salvation, as it says in the Gospel of John, cometh from the Jew. First, the Jew has to achieve their own salvation. This is not to say that the Jew is born in a state of super salvation. He is not. He has only a, a nephesh, a soul. The same soul as a Gentile, the same soul as a dog or the cat or the spider. But what the Jew can do on his own with the Gentile cannot do on his own, but requires a Jew to guide him through, is to raise himself up to a higher level of soul. This is what Ruth, the first convert, did when she, in effect, converted, said to her Jewish mother-in-law, wherever you go, I will go. Whatever you do, I will do. Your people will be my people, and your God shall be my God. Ruth transmitted the Neshuma Hashem to Ruth, who, the Gentile, who received it, and by the reception of that Neshuma, was raised up to the same exact level as her mother-in-law. I might point out, right now, you are listening to a born Jew 
a born Jew, a born Kohen, a hereditary high priest, and a Bachor, the firstborn male of my family. If, however, an Israelite who is only in the grade of ordinary soul does not aspire to rise higher, his punishment is great. The Jew is not born realized, self-realized, born like anybody else, a stupid asshole, no better, no worse than the Gentile, but with the capacity because that's what God has given him to raise himself up and thereby turn and raise up his Gentile brothers and sisters. Salvation comes from the Jew. If, however, an Israelite who is only in the grade of ordinary soul does not aspire to rise higher, his punishment is great. For there are men who cleave to the left-hand side, the evil side, because they are not endowed with more than this ordinary soul. And when this unclean spirit passes by them, it rests upon them, and they cleave to it. Thus, their sin is from the side of that unclean spirit, and their offering is a goat. Remember, I talked about that earlier. Their offering is a goat a beast which comes from the left-hand side, and so is a fitting atonement. So much, so much to know and learn. I'll mark my place here, and we'll continue with this tomorrow morning <clears throat> in the meantime let me end uh, this morning's broadcast as I end every broadcast by reciting the Kaddish the Hebrew prayer for the dead in honor and aid of our departed beloved friend fellow Kohen and Sadiq Leonard Cohen let me again mention that this recitation of the of, of the Kaddish is not just a memorial. It's not just a remembering. It is the very act of theurgy that I am discussing and the Zohar is discussing here. These words, because they are what they are, reach out and into that place of the great collective unconscious where the soul of the departed is floating and finding its way back up. And in a sense, what these words do is they take their brothers back. I got your back, bro. I got your back just as you had mine. Yiskadavi, yiskadash, meirabo. Go in peace. Go in peace, the broadcast is.